Hello, welcome to the online service of Shore Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you worshiping with us. Would you join me in a word of prayer for our time in the scripture? Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and we ask that you would um, reveal to us who Jesus is in your scripture today. You would reveal to us his glory, his supremacy, his eminence, preeminence. Um, Lord, just, um, we just pray that you would just make him known to us today in your word. We pray all this in, in his name. Amen. So last week I preached on the first chapter of Revelation as a whole, kind of did a 30,000 foot view um, look at the, at the first chapter. But this week we're going to get a little deeper into the weeds, and so we're going to look at just verses 1 through 8 today. And next week we'll look at 9 through 20. And I know that there's some people who uh, might be ready to move on to chapter 2, <laughs> while there's others who might wish that I only did verses 1 through 3 today. Uh, and I'm going to try to do my best to kind of thread the needle between seeing the big picture zoomed out and then zooming in to see some of the intricate details because this is an important practice for interpretation. You see, in order to understand the details, we have to understand the big picture. And in order to understand the big picture, we have to understand the details. Now, that might sound like circular reasoning, but rather think of it as a spiral, Right, as we're spiraling in to a central point to help us zero in on that fine point of truth. We use the big picture to help us understand the little picture and the little picture to help us understand the big picture. And so um, since there's much to cover, let's just jump right in. Again, we're looking at Revelation uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. God has something to say to you today. Hear it and apply it. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now, because we get a lot of introductory information in the beginning of any book, really, uh, I wanted to address uh, some of that introductory information quickly before we jump into the outline of today's sermon. And in our opening verses, we're given some clues that should help us interpreting the book. All right. So let's look quickly at those details, and then we'll talk about the, the four views of interpretation for the book of Revelation. The first thing that we see is that we're introduced into to the genres, all right? Now, genre is a type of writing that something is, like a, a category, you could say. For example, um, you, you wouldn't read poetry the same way that you read a science textbook. They're two different genres, all right? If, you, if you're going to interpret something, you need to know the genre that it's coming from. And Revelation identifies three genres, which, because it identifies three genres, it kind of puts it in its own unique genre. <laughs> um, but knowing how to read those three different genre, genres will help us understand how to better understand this particular unique book of Revelation. Now, obviously, it's a letter. All right, We see the common greetings and the address in this passage. And we also see uh, a common sign-off at the end of the book. 
uh, we see that it ends as a letter as well. So it's not like it just starts off as a letter for the first three chapters and then turns into something different. No, it's a letter all the way through. And in this way, uh, it fits with many of the New Testament books. And I think most of us are comfortable with reading the New Testament letters and understanding how to take them. But then in verse 3, we see that it, it also is identified as a prophecy. And now this makes it different from the New Testament books, but similar to many Old Testament books. In fact, this book could be considered, um, and has been called by some, the climax of prophecy. Uh, and we'll see that almost all of the imagery in Revelation um, is taken, it's drawn from Old Testament sources. Most of it comes from the prophets. Of course, we see some other images from um, references to history and poetry of the Old Testament as well. But a lot of it comes from the prophets. See, prophecy functions to both foretell and forthtell, meaning that it does predict future events, but it is primarily a call to action. And that's important to remember as we try to interpret and understand Revelation. And then in verse 1, we see that, uh, that Revelation is a revelation, right? Or an apocalypse, an apocalyptic literature, all right? Now, apocalyptic literature is rich with symbolism, numerology, and imagery, some of which can be used at, to be intentionally veiled language um, in order to critique power without the repercussions of that power <laughs> wanting to crack down on you. Uh, an example of this can be seen in Revelation is that many, many scholars decode the number 666, which you've probably heard and are familiar with. They decode that number to signify uh, the word Caesar Nero, right, who was the leader of Rome um, for a time, and possibly at the time this was written, possibly before this was written. Um, that's up for debate. But uh, uh, apocalyptic literature uh, also usually focuses on end times events, though oftentimes those end times events in the, the dramatic way of speaking um, is used to actually interpret a present political situation. So it's good to know these things. All right, and, in the, and remember that none of these genres, these three genres, um, require that revelation fit into those neat boxes. All right, the fact that three genres are identified, again, puts revelation into a category of its own. But they, they may be helpful and useful to us when we're trying to interpret it, to know that these are three categories which revelation kind of falls at least partially into. Now, second, we see the author is John. He identifies himself as John, and there's always debate. Almost every book of the Bible has a debate about whether uh, the identified author is the actual author, um, amongst scholars, that is, critics. But uh, suffice it to say that we have ample early church evidence that supports the fact that this John is the Apostle John, the beloved disciple who reclined on Jesus' breast. Right? This is uh, not his brother, uh, or not, and not the Baptist. Uh, this is... Um, this is John, the, the apostle. All right, so here already is, is a place where uh, Revelation strays from most apocalyptic genre, as, as most uh, apocalyptic uh, literature is pseudepigraphal, which means that the author of it chooses a name of an ancient Israelite in history. And, and, and instead of using their own, they, they use a fake name, a pen name. Um, and they pick someone famous, usually. So that's not happening here. We believe this is written by John. He says it's written by him. We believe we have good evidence that it was written by him. But the third thing we see is we see the recipients. Um, we see that they are the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And if I can figure out the technology behind it, I'll throw up a picture right here. And, uh, and you can see a little map of the seven churches, you can see that they are, there's, there would be a circular route in, in taking this letter to those churches. Again, the fact that this letter is to these seven churches, which existed in a real place and in a real time, that must influence our interpretation of the text. 
Now, some of you might be wondering, what view do you have, Chris, of how to interpret Revelation? I mean, many of you may have heard of different labels for end times theology, like pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill, etc. Well, those are labels for views of a very specific part of Revelation, which we find in Revelation 20. And so we'll deal with those particular views when we get there, and we'll, which won't be for a while. But rather, I want to introduce you to the four main views of interpreting the book as a whole. And those views are the preterist view, which in the strictest sense is the view that everything that is predicted in Revelation has already occurred from our perspective. Usually they view the imagery and symbolism as pointing specifically to the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD. And there are, however, many people, myself included, who would consider themselves partial preterists, which means that they leave room for the fact that some of the book may still be about future events to even us. Um, so that's one view, the preterist view. The second view is called the historicist view. This is the view that the predictions in Revelation have been and or are being fulfilled throughout history. Now, this is actually the view that was um, most often held by the reformers who specifically identified, uh, identified Revelation working this way to identify the papacy, the pope, as the Antichrist. All right, so they were kind of a little biased there. We'll give that. We'll give them that. Um, uh, but um, the problem with with the historicist view is that everyone who tries to assign certain images to certain predictions and certain events in actual history um, will come up with a different scheme than the next guy. All right. So no one can agree on what these things fit on. So now <clears throat> let's go to the third one before I say anything about that. Uh, the third view is the futurist view. Now, this is the view that everything, at least after chapter 3, is still future to us today and will only occur in the quote-unquote end times, the, the end of time. Um, and so that's the, the futurist view. The idealist view is the view that what is revealed in Revelation is true for all times. Uh, so this view doesn't try to find particular fulfillments of the visions, but sees them as a picture of the great drama of the conflict between Christ and Satan. Now listen, all of these views have strengths and all of them have weaknesses. And you'll probably see that as we go through Revelation, that the truth probably comes in some combination of all four of these views. Uh, maybe... I, I kind of lean away from the historicist one the most, but um, if the idealist view is true, uh, then then it could very easily be that these things that the historicists are seeing are repetitions of this great theme that is going throughout history. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Uh, now I'll, I'll explain more as we go along, but I wanted you to have those four categories in your mind, uh, because I'm going to refer to them as we unpack different interpretations of certain passages. But for now, let's go ahead and jump into our outline for today's text, which is, I know I, ta I, I take it a little out of order today, but so we're going to start in verse four and we'll come back to verses one and three at the end, one through three at the end. So in verse four, we're going to start off with the Trinitarian greeting. Look at verse four. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, this shows us that this is a letter, obviously. Again, we see the author, we see the recipients, uh, and though we uh, also uh, must remember that the number in an apocalyptic, especially apocalyptic literature, the number seven is a symbolic number. It's a, a symbol of completeness or fullness. So the fact that this letter is sent to seven churches probably means it's sent to 
all the churches. Okay. Now, granted, these are seven churches that John would have had specific relationships with, but he probably would have had relationships with many other various churches in Asia Minor. And, uh, and, and these were probably the big churches, the major postal hubs, right, of Asia Minor. And so this, this letter probably was not only passed to these churches and read at these churches, but passed even to churches in the surrounding areas of those churches um, at that time. Uh, there's also a sense in which this scripture is for all churches in all times and all places, just like all scripture is, right? All scripture is God read and useful, right? So uh, as long as we're interpreting this scripture first in its proper contexts, uh, in its proper time and place, for one, then we can then we can draw principles out of it, which we can then apply to ourselves today. And so we want to do that and do that well. And we'll talk more about interpretation as we go on um, throughout this series. Now, <clears throat> in this greeting, we already have a difficult to interpret phrase, which is this seven spirits which are before the throne. Now, some have believed that these seven spirits are angels. Um, and you can kind of see how they get there because we, we are going to hear soon in the next section about seven angels uh, or messengers um, for the ch seven churches. But these seven spirits, <clears throat> most scholars have concluded, um, are a reference to the one Holy Spirit. Now, that view makes the most sense to me, just given the immediate context. I want you to notice that there are three people listed here in this greeting. Him who is, was, and is to come, the seven spirits, and Jesus Christ. So if the first is the Father, the third is the Son, then the second is most likely the Holy Spirit. All right, and, and so then we see a phrase, th this phrase, the seven spirits, used again throughout Revelation in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 5, and chapter 5. Verse 6, and in 5 verse 6, I think it's most plain to see that this is referring to the Holy Spirit because Jesus sends the seven spirits out over the earth just as he did with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So these spirits, the reason there are seven from them, I understand the seven spirits to be a representation of the fullness of the Holy Spirit who indwells believers in all churches, specifically in these seven churches, right, which represent all churches. Um, and, and so because we understand it that way, we, what we have here is a Trinitarian greeting. Without explicitly saying so, that is what John is doing. He's affirming the doctrine of the Trinity. But more importantly than affirming the doctrine, he reminds his audience that the fullness of the Trinity, the fullness of the Godhead, has grace and peace for them, despite their circumstances that they're facing. Remember, these churches are about to face an increasing persecution. And John wants to remind them that God in all three persons is with them. <coughs> Pardon me. And more than that, more than the fact that he's just with them, John highlights certain characteristics of the Trinity, which might be particularly encouraging to these churches at this moment. And so by calling the Father the one who is, who was, and is to come, he kind of harkens back to Exodus 3, 14, when God identifies himself to Moses in the burning bush as I am who I am, right? The God who is, who is being. Uh, he is the God who is, who uh, who was and uh, and who is to come, who be, who will be what he will be, right? Who is what he is, was what he was, will be what he will be. This is the God who saved the, the Hebrew slaves from their oppression, their persecution in Egypt. And he's the same God who gives grace and peace to this persecuted church even now. Now, this uh, phrase might even take us to the prophet Isaiah, 
in chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, where God says in an oracle to Isaiah, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. God's in control, right? In the context of Isaiah, God is foretelling how he will use Babylon to be his instrument of discipline for his people. He is foretelling the exile. And if God can demonstrate his power over the king of Egypt, over the king of Babylon, why should his people fear the emperor of Rome? They shouldn't. Now moving on to the seven spirits who are before the throne. Again, this refers to the Holy Spirit. And John is most likely re referencing Zechariah chapter 4, where we see a bunch of images that are familiar to the book of Revelation. We see bowls and scrolls and lampstands, and, and we're going to see, we're going to go, we're going to be in Zechariah a lot. Let me tell you that much, because we're going to see horns and, oh man, almost all the images from, from Revelation appear in Zechariah. Um, but in, in, in Zechariah 4, in, spe in specific, um, in that passage, we see the seven eyes of Yahweh, with, uh, which range through the whole earth. Both uh, images, both of those images, the one in Revelation and the one in Zechariah, show the ubiquitous nature of the Holy Spirit. God, by his Spirit, sees everywhere, including his children who are coming under per persecution in these seven churches the Spirit is in all of those churches. God is present by His Spirit in all of them. Finally, we see Jesus described as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Now, as a faithful witness and a martyr in his own right, he is an example to those in his church who will soon be called to be faithful witnesses in the midst of persecution. They may be even asked to face death like Jesus did. But they should be encouraged that death is not the end. And Jesus' resurrection, his being firstborn from the dead, is proof of that. It proves that we also will be resurrected from the dead like him. But it also proves his authority over death and therefore not a leap to understand that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, it's important <clears throat> that you notice the present tense here. Jesus will not one day be the ruler of the kings of the earth. He currently is. He sits on the throne of majesty and all authority has been given to him, present tense. Who better to have on your side when it seems that you might be going up against a worldly authority in your near future than the one who rules over those authorities? And by going up against the worldly authority of Rome, that may mean, and probably will mean, laying your life down. We might immediately think of other people who have defied worldly authority for the sake of Christ, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood against the Third Reich and even conspired to assassinate Hitler. But, but rather than giving us the confidence to rebel, this greeting wants to give Christians the comfort and the encouragement to face their own deaths, knowing that death is not the end. And then this Trinitarian greeting that does that, that gives that confidence, moves directly into a threefold doxology. Now a doxology, like the one we sing every week, is a word which comes from the Greek and through the Latin, meaning a word of glory. It is basically a, a short hymn uh, or praise to God. And here we see it takes three parts. <clears throat> the first part of the doxology um, shows us what he has done. It reminds the believer of what Jesus has done. And it says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now first off, Jesus loves you. This I know. We even have a children's song 
to tell us so, right? Um, but sometimes I think we hear that enough that we fail to let it sink in. Jesus loves you. He, he like, he loves you. <laughs> and if Jesus loves you, what does it matter if some other sinner doesn't love you? What does it matter what they think of you? Why do we feel the need to please people, to be people pleasers, when we are loved by the King of all kings? You don't have to give in to some idol of people pleasing. You, you, your desire to be loved has been met by the high King of heaven. Jesus loves you. His disposition towards you is kindness. You don't need to beat yourself up when you make mistakes. And he has proven his love for you by freeing you from your sins, by his blood. So you really don't have to beat yourself up when you make mistakes because he was literally beaten up on your behalf. Jesus loved you enough to say, you know what? Put Chris's mistakes, put Chris's sins, put Chris's transgressions on my tab. And he came and he was literally beaten, battered, hung on a cross and killed to take the punishment that those sins deserved so that I don't have to bear that punishment. He became my substitute. He made me right with God. Now facing death is still somewhat scary even for those who know they are heaven bound. But how much less scary is it when we know that because Jesus freed us from our sins, when we face death, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we don't face the condemnation that we deserve. His love should motivate us not only to die with courage, but also to live with courage. You see, we have been freed from sin. We should therefore not submit ourselves to our old slave master. We should live into the freedom that he has purchased for us with his blood. And we should live out our calling to be stewards of this world. You see, we are a kingdom. We have authority that Christ, the ultimate authority, has vested in us. It is an authority to be priests to a broken and fallen world. Now listen, don't get me wrong. There is only one mediator, and that is Christ. But he ascended and rules on high and has sent his spirit to dwell in us, his followers. <coughs> we are the body of Christ on earth. And because the Holy Spirit can be in every believer, Christ's mission is, to shed the go uh, shed, spread the gospel of salvation throughout the world, that mission can move forward in each one of us. He was only one man at one time, but he ascended so that he could send the Spirit, so that he could be in all of us by that Spirit, all over the world at all different times. We are called as the church, as the the body of Christ, to bring the gospel to bear in the dark corners of this world. And listen, that is not an easy task. Uh, there are some dark corners in this world. And I'm reminded of a story of Bible college professor Johanna Catanacho, who pastors a small church in the Israeli city of Jerusalem, and as a Palestinian living in Israel and a Christian to boot, he faces a wide variety of persecution. And one of the many dangerous forms of harassment comes from the Israeli soldiers who patrol the city looking for potential terrorists. And these soldiers routinely impose spontaneous curfews on the Palestinians and even have the legal right to shoot at a Palestinian if he or she does not respond quickly enough to their summons. And I feel like the recent news in this area of the world has given you a feeling for the tensions that are between these people groups. Yet, Christ's 
command in the Sermon on the Mount is to love your enemies. Now, this seemed impossible to Johanna. And, and yet, there it was, unambiguous and unchanging. For me, he says, love was an active and countercultural decision. Because I was living in a cultural culture that promoted hatred of the other. And not only did the context promote hate, but the circumstances fed it on a daily basis. The newspapers, televisions, media, neighbors, everything. One of the markers of the Israeli Jews and the Palestinian Arabs is alienating the other. To break that marker, I must have some other worldview. Now at first, Johanna tried to and failed in his attempts to feel love for his enemy, or for the other. Instead, the Israeli soldiers' random daily checks for Palestinian identification cards, sometimes stopping them for hours, fed Johanna's fear and anger. And as he confessed in his inability to God, Johanna realized something significant. The radical love of Christ is not an emotion, but a decision. He decided to show love, however reluctantly, by sharing the gospel message in this dark place with the soldiers on the street. With new resolution, Johanna began to carry copies of a flyer with him, written in Hebrew and in English, with a quotation from Isaiah 53 and the words, real love printed across the top. Every time a soldier stopped him, he handed him both his ID card and this flyer. And because the quote came from the Hebrew scriptures, the soldiers usually asked him about it before letting him go. And after several months of this, Johanna suddenly noticed his feelings towards the soldiers had changed. I was surprised, you know, he says. It was a process, but I didn't pay attention to that process. My older feelings were not there anymore. I, I would pass in the same street, see the same soldiers as before, but now find myself praying, Lord, let them stop me so that I can share with them the love of Christ. This is the kind of witness, faithful witness that we are called to be. This is how we, a kingdom of priests, are called to bring the gospel to bear through difficult choices to love instead of hate, to care instead of fear, to trust instead of hate and fear. Jesus calls us to, to be different, but he gives us courage to live lives of love even when we face persecution, and death because of what he has done and also what he will do, which is the second part of our doxology, where it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Now again, see, this is future tense. This is what Jesus will do. And this statement is a mashup of two scriptures. The first is Daniel 7, which I read last week, which talks about the Son of Man coming with the clouds and being given dominion and a kingdom. <coughs> the second is Zechariah 12.10, which says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, I also want you to notice at this point, this repeated idea we see in our text of Jesus coming. Twice in our text, we see that Yahweh was and is and is to come, right? Not just will be but is to come. Um, this coming uh, is a theme throughout Revelation that we're going to see. And here we see he's coming with the clouds in this particular image. 
And in our minds, we might jump immediately to the second coming, when he will come to judge the world. But there is a sense in which Jesus is coming to visit judgment can come in a more immediate way. In fact, the context of, of the Zechariah passage, uh, which this alludes to, is the context of Israel weeping, not the nations weeping, just Israel. Um, and in our scripture today, even the word translated world could also be translated land, making tribes of the land more a more of an apt descriptor of Israel than the whole world, rather than the nations of the world, right? Tribes of the land as opposed to nations of the world. Um, and all of this language, Zechariah, here in Revelation, is very parallel with the language we see in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, which many believe is about the end of the world, the very end. But the thing is that in the Olivet Discourse, there is a phrase which should give us pause. And, and that phrase is, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Should make us feel like, whoa, wait a second. Okay. Maybe all this language that sounds so catastrophic and therefore in our minds apocalyptic or end of, end of times-y, may be referring to a near event, or at, at least in part to a near event. And I tend to think of this as one of those places in prophecy that is potential for prophetic foreshortening, right? Can this language refer both to the fall of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD, and the end of time? Maybe. But in the meantime, I think we need to hold our interpretations of these prophecies with an open hand because we cannot know for sure what is yet to come. We can easily look back on Old Testament prophecies and see how they were fulfilled in Christ's first coming, and we can kind of lock those down solid. But the people in the Old Testament, when they got those prophecies, they probably thought that the near fulfillment that they had was the only thing they had. <laughs> Or, or they had to hold it with a loose hand because they didn't understand who Jesus would be in his first coming. Now, however you read this, um, this particular part of coming with the clouds, there is a future coming of judgment that, that will be met with grief over the rejection of the Messiah by Israel. And this judgment, it could be the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, or it could be looking further forward to a more final judgment. Either way, what is clear is that Jesus is the one who is doing the judging. Whether Jesus is establishing his kingdom on earth or is ushering in the new heavens and the new earth, Jesus is the one in control. And this is only strengthened by the third part of this doxology, where we see who he says he is. Look at verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now we've already examined the meaning of these words, but what is significant now is that Jesus applies to these, these words to himself that were formerly apl uh, applied to the Father. Jesus is God. Now, Jesus is not the Father. So if the Father, but he is of one substance with the Father. So if the Father is, was, and is to come, Jesus is, was, and is to come. He is the Almighty. And all this doxological description should bring us to is a place where we know that our King wins and that our king is in control. He's in charge. Now, why does that matter? So let us re re return now to the introduction. Look, look at verses 1 through 3, where we're going to see a chain of witnesses. Look, look again at these verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made them known by sending an angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed 
is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, this introduction kind of stands out, all right? It isn't the reading of the letter. That doesn't come until verse 4. And that would seem to be the normal starting place of a letter, right? It's almost as if John got done writing the letter and then came back and added this introduction as if it were a header or a title for the letter. Uh, but within this brief introduction, we get some interesting information. Specifically, we see a chain of witnesses. Now, first, it, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means it is about revealing him and also revealed by him. But notice, even though there's a revelation of Jesus Christ, it was given to Jesus Christ by God, presumably the Father. And then Jesus gives it to an angel, who then gives it to John, who then gives it to everyone he sees and writes it down in this letter, which is to be passed among the churches. And he ends the introduction with this beatitude. Now, a beatitude is a statement of blessing. You may remember when we went through the Beatitudes of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount a couple years ago. Now, during that series, we learned that to be blessed is to be happy. Now, this is not a promise that your life will be better, that you will have more material success, or even that you will necessarily feel happier. But you will be happier if you do or embody these things. And so in our text today, those things we see in this beatitude are the reading, hearing, and keeping of the words of this prophecy. Now, of course, this blessing was meant for those who read and heard this letter as it was circulated through Asia Minor. And there was something in these words that, that those people in those churches could not only read and hear, but that they could also keep. And obey. There is a, a practical usefulness of this book. It is not just a mysterious coded language that may one day be useful to us if the end of time happens during our life. No, it was useful back then and it is useful now. And I believe that we are going to mine many specific uses from it. But for today, I think the thing that we should walk away keeping is our place in this chain of witnesses. You see, Jesus has been exalted as the faithful witness, our exemplar. But he has also freed us from sin and made us a kingdom of priests who bring the gospel to bear in the world. We have been promised not only um, that we are are blessed if we hear these words, but if we read them to other people and if we keep them. And, and I think we keep them by recognizing that Christ is our King. He is the King of Kings. He is building a kingdom here and now. It started 2,000 years ago and even just 40 years into its building. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, and that probably seemed like the end of the world to those early believers. But no matter what kind of hardships and setbacks we face, Jesus is King. He is Almighty. He loves us and holds us in His hands, and He is building His kingdom. So what does that look like for you? To be in that chain of witnesses who play a part in building that kingdom. God gave this revelation that Jesus is king to Jesus himself. Jesus sent it through an angel to John. John told the churches and us, who are you going to tell? And before you can answer that, you have to answer, is he really king in your life? Do you read these doxologies and think, amen, praise God, or are you still trying to be the Alpha and Omega of your own life? We can't be 
faithful witnesses who tell others about Jesus' kingdom if we're still trying to be almighty over our own kingdom. Believe the good news, not just that you have been freed from sin, but that Jesus is king over all, and therefore you have nothing to fear. You can face death, knowing that death is not the end, if Jesus is king. You can face employers, you can face clients, you can face financial crises, you can face disappointment with relationships. You can face anything. You can face it all if Christ is king. And then when you are resting in his love and in his power, being a faithful witness will come naturally. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, make us faithful witnesses like your son Jesus, who came, who faced death for the good of his brothers and sisters, that we might be given a newness of life, that we might be restored to relationship with you. Let this be the good news that motivates every aspect of our being. Let us be so enamored with his kingship and the kingdom he's building here that we can't but help to be good witnesses, faithful witnesses of the good news to those around us. Lord, empower us by your ubiquitous spirit to be sharing the gospel into the dark places of this world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.